Greenland is a part of the world which most of us rarely think about. If you're anything like me, you could probably write down everything that you know about Greenland on the back of a cigarette packet. And I don't mean the old style cigarette packets, I mean one of the new ones with smoking curls written on the front of it, a picture of a gammy lung, and a quick comment about erectile dysfunction. Or at least, that's how little I knew about Greenland up until a month or so ago, when I watched a program about the island and became briefly obsessed with the place. Whenever I discover a fascinating part of the world that I don't know much about, that tends to be an evening lost in finding out everything that I can. Once I'm done discovering all of the usual stuff, the fascination turns to the country's football. Subscribers to this channel might be aware of what I'm talking about, most football channels tend to steer clear of making videos about Tajikistan, the Marshall Islands, Iraq, and North Korea, but not this one. Today's video was actually suggested by someone at some stage, I'm pretty sure, though I forget who, and I foolishly failed to take stock of their name. But thank you to them, whoever and wherever you are. Before I start, it won't surprise you to discover that there isn't a plethora of images of football being played in Greenland in the Getty Images database. Only four, as far as I can tell. So whilst I'll do my best to keep you visually stimulated, if you'd like to treat this video as more of a podcast, or any of my videos for that matter, I might suggest that you won't miss out on much. With that long, self-indulgent throat clearing out of the way, I invite you to switch off from the outside world, immerse yourself in the rocky and icy landscape of Greenland, as we look to see through the fog and get a clear idea of why Greenland doesn't yet have a FIFA-affiliated national football team. Greenland is the largest island in the world. With a landmass greater than 1.2 million kilometers squared, if Greenland were an independent member of the EU, it would be the largest nation within the European Union, and the 12th largest on Earth. Though Greenland is larger in terms of size than Indonesia, there are street corners in Jakarta with populations that could rival the number of citizens that inhabit the entire island of Greenland. With a population of 57,000, Greenland is the least densely populated country or dependency on the planet. And that brings a unique set of logistical challenges when it comes to playing the world's most popular sport. You see, Greenland is nine times the size of the United Kingdom, yet it has fewer inhabitants than the city of Hereford. What's more, Greenland isn't quite like Iceland, which is also extremely barren. In Iceland, 64% of the population live within just 1% of the island's total land mass, in Greater Reykjavik, and there is at least a functioning road system which links the nation's major regions. Greenland is much, much more spread out, and there are no roads between settlements, making domestic travel a gargantuan challenge. Though most of Greenland's settlements are located on the island's west coast, and particularly on the southwest coast, they are still separated by vast distances, and the exceptions, such as Itokame on Greenland's east coast, are among the most isolated settlements on Earth. Almost 90% of Greenland's population are Inuit, typically referred to as Greenlanders, with the bulk of the remaining 10% having arrived from mainland Denmark. Greenland isn't a country, because it is part of the Kingdom of Denmark though it does have considerable autonomy when compared to most overseas territories. Geographically, Greenland is part of North America, and most Greenlanders are descendants of Inuit settlers who moved to the island from Canada and Alaska around 800 years ago. However, Greenland was the first part of continental North America to be reached by European explorers, from Norway and Iceland, and it has spent the last 1,000 years politically and culturally aligned with Europe more than it has done with North America. Norway effectively and later officially controlled Greenland for a few hundred years before the Black Death weakened Norway's international influence, and Greenland became relatively unclaimed. The Portuguese made a brief claim right at the end of the 1400s, but by the 17th century, Norway and Denmark had reasserted joint control, which lasted until 1814 when Denmark took full control over the island. Greenlanders have steadily grown their influence over their own fate ever since, culminating in the landmark 2008 Self-Government Act, which essentially gave Greenland full control over its own domestic affairs, with the exception of foreign affairs, defence and monetary policy, though polling suggests that a majority of Greenlanders want to take this even further and gain full independence in the future. The only issue with this desire is that two-thirds of Greenland's national budget comes from Denmark, and though the island is rich in natural resources and precious metals, much of it is buried under ice and is only slowly being revealed as Greenland, like the rest of the world, heats up at an alarming rate. Now, you may be listening to all of this and thinking, of course Greenland doesn't have a FIFA-affiliated national football team. 
It's an enormous freezing cold island with barely any inhabitants, and it isn't even an independent national state. And all of that would be correct. However, the Faroe Islands is an autonomous administrative division of the Kingdom of Denmark as well, with an even smaller population than Greenland, and yet they still have a FIFA-affiliated national team, and a competitive one at that. On the population front, Liechtenstein, Gibraltar, and San Marino all have smaller populations than Greenland, and in terms of not being an independent state, nor are England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Indeed, taking Scotland as an example, the Parliament of Greenland has far greater devolved powers than Holyrood, and none of these factors have stopped national teams from gaining FIFA and UEFA recognition in the past. You might also be thinking, do Greenlanders even care about football? But the answer to that question is very much yes. The sport was first brought to the island from Denmark, but Greenland is as passionate about football as almost any other region on Earth. Despite the unfavourable climate, 10% of Greenland's population of 57,000 battle against the odds to play football on a regular basis. And though they're not yet FIFA or UEFA affiliated, the island does have a representative team. The unofficial Greenland national football team played their first international all the way back in 1980, when they were thrashed 6-0 by the Faroe Islands. At the Island Games, Greenland have twice finished as runners-up in 2013 and 2017, losing finals against Bermuda and the Isle of Man. Greenland even briefly hosted their own international football tournament from 1980 to 1984, of which there were three editions, though they never managed to win the tournament themselves. Iceland beat the Faroe Islands in the final in 1980, the Faroe Islands then exacted revenge against Iceland in the final in 1983, and the 1984 final ended in a draw between, you guessed it, Iceland and the Faroe Islands. If nothing else, the Greenland Cup was the most symmetrical tournament of all time. So what has stopped Greenland graduating from unofficial competitions and representative friendly games to the big time of FIFA and UEFA affiliated competitions? Because it certainly isn't an appetite for the sport. Well, for a start, one of Greenland's longest standing struggles has unsurprisingly been against the elements. Despite the name, Greenland is almost entirely covered in ice, and there is more grass at one of Snoop Dogg's house parties than there is on the world's largest island. It's often claimed that Greenland was named thus by exiled explorer Eric the Red, since he thought the name would make the island seem more attractive to settlers, though it is likely that Greenland was actually considerably more green 1,000 years ago. Nowadays, however, 79% of Greenland is covered in the only ice sheet that you will find on Earth outside of Antarctica. Permafrost makes growing grass in Greenland a challenge, to put it mildly, and it would be impossible to maintain a grass pitch all year round without an extremely expensive system of undersoil heating, retractable roofs, and the works. Consequently, football in Greenland has historically been played on gravel, or sand and ash, which is obviously very dangerous for players, and it makes Greenland's pitches almost unique when compared with the rest of the world. In 2010, the island finally got its first artificial pitch, funded by FIFA and opened by Sepp Blatter in the town of Kakatok, population 3,000, making it the fifth largest settlement on the island. Happily, a handful of other artificial services have followed, including two in the capital city of Nuuk, one full-size pitch, and one half-size for training exercises, and for games involving a smaller number of players. This is progress, but even with artificial turf, Greenlanders can only actually play football outdoors for two or three months a year, depending on the conditions, typically May through to September, and for the rest of the year, Greenland's footballers are tucked away playing on hard surfaces in indoor pitches. This is a problem for which there is no obvious fix, but one thing Greenland does hope can be fixed is their lack of a national stadium. If Greenland are to become an affiliated national team, they will need a national stadium that FIFA deems to be fit for purpose. The artificial turf at the Nuke Stadium, which is where the Greenland national team play their unofficial matches at the moment, is two-star rated, which is the highest rating possible for an artificial pitch, and it's considered to be suitable for all UEFA competitions. However, the Nuke Stadium itself is, well, let's be frank, it's pretty generous to call it a stadium at all. It is an artificial pitch with a fence and some gravel around the outside of it for people to stand on and watch, which they've slapped with a capacity of 2,000. The Greenlandic government wants to replace the Nuke Stadium with a proposed ground called the Arctic Stadium, which, as you can see, and apologies to those of you who I told to treat this as a podcast, is a rather different beast. 
The Arctic Stadium, or Arctisk Stadion in Greenlandic, is said to have a planned capacity of 20,000 and will cost roughly £35 million to build, which I can't quite wrap my head around. The entire population of Nuuk is 17,635, and the ambitious ground, originally scheduled to be opened in 2020, is still very much in the planning stage, unsurprisingly due to a lack of funds. Getting the stadium in place will no doubt be one of the biggest hurdles for Greenland, but it isn't their only hurdle. Though Greenland does have a national football league system, administered by the Football Association of Greenland, that pesky ice makes travel extremely difficult. Greenland is home to over 70 football clubs, with more than 5,000 members in total. But naturally, given the island's demographics, these teams are very spread out. With no roads to connect them, the FA solution has been to create regional leagues, building up to a six-day national championship in Nuuk, which is televised across the island, and decides the national champion. It is officially the shortest national championship on earth, though even condensing how the title is decided into less than a week doesn't suit everyone. Travel to and from Nuuk alone can take a week for some islanders, who simply cannot get the time off work. Some players have been known to quit their day jobs in order to travel to the national championships or to compete abroad. Speaking of travelling abroad, air travel is crucial to Greenland, given the lack of roads, but it is also prohibitively expensive. International flights are infrequent and cost a fortune, with almost all flights other than to Iceland involving stop-offs due to Greenland's runways, first built by the US military, only being long enough to accommodate light aircraft. This is a significant hurdle for a prospective Greenland national team, though it is not insurmountable. It will just require a large injection of cash, which, as of yet, has not been forthcoming. Another problem for Greenland is that in order to join FIFA, they must first join one of international football's associations and confederations. The most obvious candidate would be Europe. Greenland is culturally and politically aligned with Europe, not to mention the fact that almost all the unofficial international football that they have previously played has been against Nordic opposition. However, UEFA recently introduced requirements that new members must be independent nations, which seems to be an unusual requirement for an organisation with so many members who don't meet that criteria already. Nonetheless, it could be a stumbling block for Greenland, and it may lead them to approach CONCACAF instead, who have introduced no such requirements. Geographically, it would make plenty of sense, though they would become only the fourth members of the North American Football Union, a subdivision of CONCACAF, if they were to do so, and the NAFU members would then read Canada, the United States, Mexico, and Greenland. Again, it is not insurmountable, but it is awkward. But then, life is awkward for Greenlanders, yet they make it work for them. So why should football be any different? For a nation of football lovers who have honed their skills on ash and sand in sub-zero temperatures, risking squeamish injuries every time they step onto the field, they are unlikely to be deterred by administrative issues. Greenland is not without footballing icons. The island's best-known export is Jesper Gronka, a man who changed the face of English football forever. Born in Greenland, but raised in Denmark, Gronka scored Chelsea's winner against Liverpool in the final game of the 2002-03 Premier League season to secure a place in the Champions League for the Blues for the following season. That might not seem that significant, but it is well documented that Roman Abramovich was only interested in acquiring the club if they were in the Champions League. For that reason, Gronkai's heroics have come to be known as the Billion Pound Goal. The talented Nuke native, somewhat understandably, chose to represent Denmark rather than his homeland, which was, and still is, without a recognised national team going on to win 80 caps, which puts him 19th in Denmark's all-time appearance charts. These days, there are just a handful of Greenlanders who play in Denmark and the Faroe Islands, but there are a whole generation crying out for greater facilities, coaching, and exposure. Hopefully, in the not-too-distant future, they'll get their wish. So that is it for today's video. Hopefully you now know a little bit more about Greenland, other than the fact that its ice is melting and that Donald Trump wanted to buy it for the United States. A big hello to the small number of Greenlanders who subscribe to HITC7s. I know there is a pocket of you out there, despite the analytics telling me that you're simply Danes. Thank you all as ever for watching, wherever you tuned in from. Smash the like button if you enjoyed today's video, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC7s. You can also find me on Twitter or Instagram, or indeed both, via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.